as much as uh, we could about the, his plans for the reassessment that's scheduled for next year. It's going on right now. <coughs> and, uh, and the board agreed, so it's not my call, it's the board's. Okay. Well, we're at the end of a five-year plan. At the end of the five-year plan, we have to do a rebuild, which means we have to review every single parcel in the town. Now, normally every year we do an update, which means we do a... <coughs> we have someone that comes in and they give us a, their viewpoint on what they think is high and what they think is low, and then we review all those properties. A couple of years ago, the state said that the commercials were low, low so we redid all the commercials. This year we're redoing everything. The only thing that... And it's probably not going to affect the village much, but uh, the highest increase is going to be in the vacant land. It's going to be what? Vacant land. Farmland in Sweden is selling for thirty-five. We've had some parcels sold for five thousand an acre. Wow. And is that for this, development purposes? No, that's farmer farm. to farmer. No. Yeah. Well, no. For years, well, you know, mm -hmm. corn is nine dollars a bushel. Yeah. You know, they, they could pay off that property, and most of them are paying cash. There's no financing involved in most of this. <coughs> so, we're a little low on the farmland, that's going to go up. What is um, that now? Oh. It's 2,000 an acre. Oh, wow. So, it's well below what the market is. Um, also, believe it or not, the recreational land is very, has gone up quite a bit. Um, Wetlands that we had assessed at two hundred dollars an acre is selling for upwards of a thousand dollars an acre just for hunting land. Mm -hmm. So and again, the state comes in and they, they review everything at the end of the year and they tell me you're low here, you need to make some adjustments here, and that's what I did. <coughs> but again, this is the end of a five-year plan, so we have to do everything anyway. Um, is it your five-year plan or the state's five-year plan? It's my five-year plan with the state. <clears throat> we have to set a schedule with the state, and we can do three, five, or seven. So I've been set up, originally I was set up to do six. Then the state came back and said we're going to reduce it to five. So this is the end of this five-year plan and the beginning of the next five-year plan. So in another five years, we'll be doing this all over again. But again, we look at everything every year. And if we're low in certain areas, we raise them. If we're high in certain areas, we lower them. Of course, nobody ever notices when they get lowered. And nobody comes running to my office saying, why did you lower my assessment? But they do come in when it goes up. <laughs> which is why we give them a chance to come in for a hearing. So, Mr. Ethelon, I had a question. Uh, about the boarding houses and the rentals in the village, mm -hmm. are they all assessed based on their profits? No. They're assessed based on what they are. I don't understand. Well, if they're a single-family house, they're based on the market of a single-family house. If they're... <coughs> If they're two families, then they're based on the market of two families. And three families and four elevens and up. Um, rooming houses, they're based on income. All the rooming houses All are the based, rooming on house. based on income. Mm -hmm. Rooming houses, but not rentals? No, rooming houses. If they're, if, they're, if, they're, if they're on the schedule as rooming houses, which are 418s, it's a commercial. And, they, and they're done by income. A single family house that's rented out to students, it's done by market. So the state doesn't require that a property that is a, considered a rental property and the individual is claiming income? No, then I'd have to go knock on everybody's door and say, are you a rental property? Mm -hmm. So, that, I mean, there's, there's just no state regulation on that? No. Mm -hmm. It's based on what it's what its use is at the present time. Now, if it's used as a rooming house and the village has it on their books as a rooming house, I'll value it as a rooming house. 
But what, I, can't, I can't go and knock on everybody's door and say, are you a rooming house? What about the uh, buildings that have four or more apartments? They're commercial. All of them are commercial? Yep. They're four elevens. Anything above a three unit is a commercial property. And then the income is taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. Is that a hard and fast rule throughout the state? Yes, it's a state rule. Mm -hmm. Now, every every time I do an update, I send out income and expense statements. Mm -hmm. And I don't get a lot of them back. So what I do usually is I use whatever I can find from the marketplace. And believe it or not, there's a lot of people that have, that do put their advertising out there, and I use that. For the cost of the rental? For the income. Right. For the income capitalization. Mm -hmm. My concern was that it seems to me that by <coughs> counting some of the rentals as based on their appearance, their uh, the marketplace, mm -hmm. how single families are done, um, gives some people an incentive to allow their properties to degrade, to lower their taxes, or at least not to raise them. Okay. <laughs> is there anything that the state gives, is there any tool that the state gives us? Oh, no, you've, you've got your own zoning, zoning uh, officer. Someone that has to take care of that. I can't tell somebody that they have to paint their house. Uh, Tony, how is it determined <coughs> that a property is a boarding house rather than a single family house that's being rented out to X number of students? <coughs> well, if it was a boarding house, it stayed on the books as a boarding house. The, by the, the village? The village, the yeah, that's right, by the village. How, <coughs> now, what, what criteria would the village use to make that determination? They have to do the C of O and they have to determine that it is a rooming house. And, and what would be the criteria that you'd use to identify it? As then I could use income instead of market. Yeah, but but the criteria is probably historical. What, the, what criteria would the village use to determine it was a boarding house? Well, <coughs> I'm, it's my understanding that anybody that rents to students has to have a CFO. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you would have that list. But you don't have to okay. register it as a rooming house. I think that you, in order, I thought it was a, a village village rule, not a state rule. Boarding houses have existed for a long time, and I think that and they were kind of grandfathered in, as I mm -hmm. understand, um, that they, originally the boarding houses were, were for college students, and they were owner-occupied with students boarding in those houses, and then, you know, then they became simply boarding houses. I don't think houses. that's correct. <coughs> a boarding house is a commercial property. Okay. So it's not. So there's a state place. definition for it. Yes. Is state legal definition. Is there a <coughs> distinction between a rooming house and a boarding house? Or are they the two, na two names for the same thing? No, a, uh, a rooming house and a boarding house. I, my interpretation is the same thing. Okay. I think that what I understand is the rooming house. They don't have individual bath facilities. An apartment does. Right. So an apartment, you have your own bath facilities, but in a boarding house, you don't. So I think that's the, the difference. Right. So you'd have house has common bathroom. For yeah. The you'd be sharing rumors. So if renters. if if the if the village determined that a particular property had a CEO that <coughs> provided for six or seven student rentals, mm -hmm. the village could declare it to be a rooming house. Right. <clears throat> and we, the village could determine the number of occupants <clears throat> by inspection. Right. But I need something in writing that I'd have to put yeah. in my file that shows that 
somebody from the village did do an inspection on the property, and that's what it's being used as. Uh -huh. okay. But I, my statement about them being historical was that there were, you know, a number of them, and they've just kind of continued to exist. And some of them did were at one time. I think, like your house, John, was at one time what a, a boarding house no. that, that was owner occupied and run right. by the person that owned it. Correct. And then. Who did that? Who? Uh, the Grenettes. Not well. Not, no, in the 40s. Oh, in the 40s. Yeah. Yeah. They, they the girls that live there in the house. Oh, yeah. But there are no new boarding houses that are being created, I think, if I'm correct. They just, you know, they have well, existed and they sort of continue well, to if they, <coughs> if they are de facto, then we can identify them as such and declare them to be such. So, do you know the difference in the assessment on a single family rather than a rooming house? A single family is done by market, and a rooming house is done by income. Is it a different price per thousand, is what I'm asking? There's no price per thousand. Market is market. Residential properties are all done by market. <coughs> Commercial properties are all done by income. So, there's no hard and fast rule. Depends on what it's used as. And that's how we determine the value. So if it were a commercial property, it's then that the income being included brings the assessment up? Let's say, let's say you own a, a four-family house and you wanted to get a mortgage on it. You'd go to the bank and the bank would say, all right, what is your rental income? Mm -hmm. And what are your expenses? That's income capitalization. That's how we do it in commercial property. Okay. What, what, what formula do you use if, if the income from a particular property is, say, $20,000 a year, uh, how, how do you translate that into uh, assessment? You take the income, well, it's a year, you, you do it by yearly, not by month. You take the yearly income, <coughs> you take out the 5% vacancy rate and the credit, and <coughs> excuse me, vacancy and credit loss, then you take out the expenses, and then you capitalize that um, over the past few years, we've been using 13.5%, including the taxes. That uh, the assessment is 13.5% no, of the income? No, no, you capitalize it by 13.5%. In other words, you take that, the net operating income and you divide it by 13.5%, and that gives you what the income, what the value should be. In other words, if you went to the bank, the bank would do the same thing. They're only going to let you borrow what they feel <coughs> the building is worth. So I'm, sorry, I'm just trying to, so you said you take the yearly income minus the expenses, minus the vacancy rate of 5% and minus Vacancy credit loss, right. Vacancy credit? Vacancy and, vacancy and credit loss. Vacancy, oh, and credit loss, okay. Do it 5%. What is credit loss? It's only not the end of rent. Oh, okay. Thank you. Have Mr. Wolf? Well, <laughs> silence is prevailing, so I guess. Well, it's a hard and fast rule, and it's, it's the way the state uh, requires us to do it. You have a company that you've hired to mm -hmm. do this process. Yeah. What about, is, is this common, I mean, I, I hear about, you know, properties that are assessed at a certain value and then, you know, they sell for under that and then the owners are stuck with that new, with, with that assessment value for what, the next five years? Well, and by the same token, if they come in and they buy it for a lot more, they're stuck with it too. Yeah, but I mean, it, it sounds like it, the only you time have I, a The mix only time it. I can change it is I <clears throat> I also belong to the Real Estate Board of Rochester. So I have that on my computer. Mm -hmm. So when a house goes on the market, I look at it. And if they've got different information than I have, I'll adjust it in my computer and I'll change it. Mm -hmm. And I'll adjust the value. But if, say, you sold your house tomorrow for hundred thousand dollars and it was only assessed for ninety. Yeah, it would stay at ninety. 
I thought the sale of the, the sale price of the house had something to do with the assessment. Sure, it's market. That's the market. But right. the house doesn't get revalued. But it's as it's as not just that house. You've got to use right, but that house. You've got to use, it's, it's, it's got to be all the properties in, in in the town have to be assessed at a hundred percent of uniform mm -hmm. or uniform value. In other words, the market sets the pace, and they have to stay at market value. And I've kept it that way since 2000. Because so, <coughs> I was originally the contractor that did the reval in 1999. So I've been here a long time, even before Alan passed away. So you have some people whose who's, uh, houses uh, um, sell for more than they're assessed, but the assessment stays the same. You have some that have the opposite problem, and you have some people that are happy and some people that are very happy. didn't see me. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, when somebody buys a house, they're going to get a mortgage and they're going to get an appraisal. They bring the appraisal in, it's a fair appraisal, I'll look at it. I mean, that's only fair. But when somebody pays more than the assessment, they don't come running in with their appraisal saying, here, I paid 200000 it's only assessed at 150 How do you deal with it if, say, some, somebody comes in and they're unhappy with their, their assessment, and so they, they think it's assessed too high, and they get a realtor, to help them out and looks at the market value of, of you know comparable properties in the area and they say, Yeah, you know, you're right, your house has been over over assessed. How, how do you how do you deal with that issue and how do you make, you know, um, I'll make an adjustment. If it's over assessed then it, then there's a mistake that's been made, I'll correct it. But do you have situations where people sometimes come in with realtor assessments and you know five different comparable properties and oh I have them all the then, time and then you don't and then you say no this is not correct you know you yeah. you're not oh yeah absolutely if I don't I mean if somebody comes in with an appraisal and you've all I'm sure familiar with appraisals don't sit down in front of my desk and wait for me to read it to you because I'm going to sit down and study that appraisal and if it's a fair appraisal I'll use it. If it's full of garbage, I'm going to throw it out. I mean, I'll be fair, but I'm not going to be hoodwinked by some. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to be stupid. No. <laughs> no, but I mean, sometimes, you know, I mean, I, I've heard of cases where you could, you know, realtors who have, have come in and, and found comparable properties and you dis you know, you disagreed. And I'm just curious about what. You know what? What? How this this process works? Do you provide a written, you know, statement to the the person who brought in and paid the realtor, you know, two hundred bucks to do this? this if study? somebody paid a realtor two hundred dollars for a market analysis, then they deserve to be over assessed because market analysis are supposed to be free. If you pay two hundred dollars for an appraisal and it's a bad appraisal. <laughs> Martin, can we entertain any questions from? Sure, that's fine with me. If people in the audience have questions, might as well since this is our our one chance. Is that okay with you? Small, okay. small well, audience. Tony, as far as I'm concerned, this has been a very useful session, and I I appreciate you taking an evening to come in and meet with us. Well, thank you for having me. Now I'm going no to go have dinner. <laughs> when should the new assessments be hitting the homeowners? Uh, hopefully I'll have them done by the end of January. So the tender will roll come out September. I have one question just based on what you said, Tony. Um, at the beginning, I, maybe I misunderstood. There was something about um, properties are I mean, you're doing the five-year reevaluation, but that you mentioned something about things are reevaluated yearly. Every year. So, um, so if that is the case, then <clears throat> if somebody 
does purchase a house uh, and their assessed value is very high, uh, you and I had a conversation about this with regard to the house on Main Street that's listed. Um, so if their uh, assessed value is, is much higher than what they purchased the house for, and if the houses are re-evaluated every annually, mm -hmm. um, then there is an opportunity for that yes, to is. be they, adjusted. Whoever, whoever the purchaser is can come in and see me and mm -hmm. show me their appraisal and I'll review it with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it isn't just that they're stuck oh, no, not, in one in for stone. five years or longer. No. The other thing that kind of I wondered about was um, regarding um, uh, boarding house being classified as a commercial property and then um, four families or more, four units or more are commercial, but there's that gap in between of uh, two family and three family houses. They're done by market. And those are market. So, um, and regarding uh, boarding houses, um, the, it was my understanding, which could be totally off, um, that that was a, a designation that um, was allowed to a certain time period in the village with uh, but now that there is no conversion of single family to boarding houses so in some ways they may be phasing out um, as uh, boarding houses perhaps are purchased to be used as single family houses because they're not really divided they're single units mm -hmm. that have multiple bedrooms that um, and they could have living you know they could be just a regular house that has four or five bedrooms and um, it's just that you because it's grandfathered in you can have more than three unrelated people living in that particular house if but it's if, a 418 uh, right with that designation from the past so am, am I correct on that yeah, yeah okay um, <clears throat> trying to think if there's anything else. Um, so I, I'm just curious, while you're looking, Kelsey, yeah. you, you mentioned, Tony, that, that, that it's a state definition as to what a boarding house is. Would this be in the New York State Uniform Code? Would that be yeah. where that definition would be? Mm -hmm. Okay. In some ways, it might make sense that <coughs> nobody was paying attention to take a boarding house and turn it into a two-family or three-family, because then you're you would avoid the commercial um, designation. Well, we've had some pretty high sales in um, in the two-family in the past couple of years, so. It's not necessarily true. Some of them have been selling for a lot of money. Mm hmm But it's, so then the market va evaluation brings in a, a higher yeah. amount. As far as income, determining income, um, you had mentioned that you use um, even advertising that people might have for what they charge mm -hmm. per month or what their rents are. Um, do you have a standard kind of rule of thumb of um, how much one bedroom will yield as on a monthly basis? It changes yearly. Um, yeah, I've tended to think of bedrooms uh, three hundred dollars per bedroom as a minimum amount for in most rental situations. So I didn't know how that factored, how that compared to your um, calculations. You're a does it seem that way? Yeah. Okay. But if you can get 300 in the bedroom, good for you. It's, I mean, they're getting $1,100 a month for three, four, three, four walk ups on Main Street. Actually, $1,100. Oh, you're talking about the luxury loft apartment. Yeah. What are they getting um, over uh, in the newer <coughs> complex across on uh, Redmond Road? You mean uh, college suites? College mm -hmm. suites. They're fourteen, twelve, fourteen hundred. A room. They're a lot of money. For, for the semester. No, for the year. Yeah, for the semester. It's they go over there. They go by semester. And a semester is four and a half months. 
But if you if you if you if you calculate it out, it comes out to about twelve hundred dollars a month. Twelve hundred a month? Yeah. Really? For for you put over there? They're beautiful. They I've, really I've are seen nice. it from the outside. No, I haven't. I paid fifteen dollars a month when I was in college. <laughs> So in that case... Yeah, but when you were in college, it was a one-room school. <laughs> <laughs> was a, it was a cow college. <laughs> so the example that you're giving uh, about the college suites, are you, you're suggesting that... You can't use that. No, I'm just... No, I can't use that in the village. No, no, no. I'm not saying that, but I'm just... I want to make sure I understand what you're saying about that situation and that you just... Indicated that the there's renting for fourteen hundred per month mm -hmm. per, per bedroom. No, it's a, there's, there's for the there's unit. Two, there's two bedroom units. Two bedroom units. So then that could be extrapolated to seven hundred a month per bedroom per student. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and that is the high end, <coughs> and most people, uh, you know, don't charge that much. That's part of the reason that there is such an interest in off-campus village rentals. But their occupancy rate's not that high, right? I haven't had any complaints from them. Well, I heard it was only about 60%. Really? Mm -hmm. And I heard they cut services. Cut services? Yeah, they, I mean, they were serving continental breakfast certain oh. days of the week and Wow. There was a shuttle service, and, and if you got locked out, it was free the first time, and then $10 after that. Now it's gone to $50 every time you're locked out, and <coughs> so I hear. Well, mm -hmm. those units all have kitchens in them, so yeah. what would be serving the kids that have breakfast? For people that don't like to cook, I guess. <laughs> so, um, most... Uh, Units like if there's a two-bedroom apartment in the village, it, what would be your experience as far as what that might rent for? Are you thinking that three hundred a bedroom on, is? It depends on the condition and the and the, and the location. Right. And it depends on who you're renting to. Uh, oh, well, college students. If you're renting to college. You're on the other side of Main Street. Right. Right. But if you're renting to college students on the west side of Main Street, a two-bedroom apartment. What would be your rule of thumb as far as a per bedroom rate per well, month? Well, you're, you're a landlord. What do you run? For, what, do you rent by semester? I already by? know my answer. I'm I'm not the tax assessor. You're the tax assessor, so that's like why. Like I told you before, it fluctuates by year. And right, but <clears> like <throat> the going rate for this year, for example. Uh, for a two bedroom unit, mm -hmm. it's probably about seven hundred dollars a month. Okay. So that would be three fifty per bedroom per month. Okay. I'm just curious what you know what you would anticipate, and and certainly if you're using the income approach for a four family, say, or a seven family, or, or you know four unit, seven unit, um, even something that's classified as a hotel. Now, our hotels, there are some hotel classifications in the village, are, do those qualify as commercial as well? Yeah. Okay. I think that's it for me for right now. Okay. Are all commercial, if it's not a, a, uh, like a rental where a living situation is a commercial building, are they all calculated with that same It'd be like formula, a downtown or? Or building? Yeah. Yeah, it's done by income. It's done by income. So, mm -hmm. all, like all commercial buildings would be yes. would be by there's, income. Yeah, because not there's not by market. No, because there, there's not enough in the market. We use the market to extrapolate the income, but <clears throat> there's not enough sales that we can use a market approach for commercial properties. Okay. Tony, one question that I'm curious about from your perspective, certainly as a real estate agent, I, you know, have my own perspective on certain locations, but do you feel as though the market, the real estate market has um, improved in the last year or two or three over the, you know, the downfall that we had um, a number of years ago? 
it's been it's flattened out a little bit, but it hasn't gone down. Mm hmm Has it improved? Has it gone up? And a little bit, not a lot. Uh huh. So when you imagine doing the reevaluation in the spring or whenever this is going to occur, um, would you tend to guess that mark the values are going to stay relatively level? Well, let me put it this way: I can't run any programs yet because not everything's in the computer. Mm -hmm. But from what I've been going over, I'd say probably more than 60% will either stay the same or go down. Mm -hmm. I pulled the figures, um, this just using the MLS uh, uh, recently, to see what uh, the last 12 months have been as far as sales compared to assessed values across the board in the town of Sweden and the village of Brockport. And, um, uh, it, I was thinking that the sale prices would have been more often above the assessed values. And I don't know if you ever look at that kind of information. I all the time. Um, but just in glancing at um, that um, collection of information recently, it seemed like almost a little over 50% of the time the property sold for. Uh, less than their assessed value, and that was also taking into account the, or including um, uh, seller concessions, which tend to elevate the sale price. You know, you I, I saw uh, Ham emailed me those, and I thought that was uh, indicated pretty accurate assessments. Is it what is fifty three percent versus forty seven percent? So it's. 53% of the time the properties sold for the selling price was less than the assessed value. And 47% was above. Right. So I thought that was pretty close. Uh, yeah, that's one way of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you, when you talk about seller concessions, Pam, most of the time that requires bank financing, correct? Right. So there's an appraisal, right? Right. Right. And the house usually appraises for the sale price. It has to. Then yeah. the seller concessions, should they come into play? Well, it's, it's, it, I think that, that certainly it does these days because I think everybody's trying to max out the income. Years ago, when Alan was still alive, um, I can remember, um, you know, that was, as time has gone on, there have been more, more and more transactions involved seller concessions. And if you, are, I don't know if you all are familiar with that, but it's where you build closing costs into the purchase price. So if a house is um, going to sell for 100000 they could build possibly up to 6%. In some cases, at USDA mortgages, they can be more than 6% can be built in. But, um, and not much more, but a little bit more. And so you might find that there's a purchase price of 106000 where the seller gets 100000 and the six thousand, the six percent, goes to the bank to cover closing costs. And um, years ago, uh, if you came in with your purchase offer and you showed that you really you built six percent in, that the assessed value would go back to the hundred thousand, not the hundred and six. But it's been really, I'd say, across the board in almost every municipality that I have heard of, you know, in the greater Rochester area, where now it, the tide has changed and a seller concession is added to the value. It has, the house has to appraise for that amount, and so that is now the new assessed value to some extent, or it's averaged over similar properties. So um, it's an, another opportunity to make money uh, by financing your closing costs. It's, it's an opportunity for the municipalities to make money when, so, when buyers don't have enough money and they have to finance their closing costs. And I tend to point out to buyers when they're doing such things that they're not only paying for their closing costs for 30 years possibly, but they're also paying for the taxes on top of that. That's right. So you want to think long and hard before you finance or closing costs? I don't think it's... For a lot of people, it's the only way they can purchase a house. Right, right. But 
<coughs> if the bank says it's worth this, they're going to loan the money. Right, absolutely. Yeah. But it, there's so many people that it would be interesting to see how many people who buy houses in the town of Sweden have to finance some of their closing costs. They don't have enough cash. And then um, if their assessed values go up, that can adversely affect their payment. Perhaps their assessed value is high to begin with, and possibly it could go down to help offset a little bit of their tight cash situation. And then, yeah, and, the, then and then what you have to take into consideration is most of the time when the realtor is showing the house, they're not explaining to the people that this is an elderly person that lives in this house and they have an enhanced star exemption and a senior star exemption on top of that, plus a couple of veterans exemptions. And the next year when they get relevied for their taxes, they come into my office crying that they're assessed that their payments going up six hundred dollars a month. Well, in the in the um, listing, it ha you have to report the true tax <coughs> figure. You can't report. Uh, any tax figures that are enhanced, they have to be the true tax. You could be, but, you could lose your license if you are not reporting the correct tax. But when the bank looks at the, at the taxes, they're looking at the taxes that are on the roll. They're not looking at no, the true taxes. No, they're looking yes, at the Yes, yes. Don't tell me no, Pam, because I'll bet you I have two or three people a year coming. Well, that would be <clears throat> the appraiser who's not doing a very good well, job. Somebody's missing it. But I could lose my license if I put in taxes that are incorrect and not the true tax figure. That's why usually in the in the private remarks of the listing it says subtract out X number of dollars for the star exemption and of course the star exemption changes depending on which municipality mm -hmm. locally I believe it's we talked about that the other day was it about yeah for the village so um, and you have to as a buyer you have to qualify with the bank with the full tax um, uh, cost, not not minus the star exemption. You will ultimately, if you apply for the star exemption, get the star exemption if you are a single family homeowner of that home. But you have to qualify with the bank when you apply for your mortgage without that star exemption. But what exemption. you're not taking into consideration is that the year that those people are in the house, they're getting their the taxes have already been paid on the house based on those exemptions. The next year they're going to get re-levied, which means the money that they got that they weren't supposed to get is going to go right on their on their next year tax roll. And the bank is going to look at that and they're going to say, oh, the taxes are this now. And they're going to recalculate their payment. I write at least three or four letters a year to the bank saying, no, it's just the real levy for this year. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I tell people, if you've got the cash, pay it now. Right. But they have to they have to qualify. The banks qualify them at the true tax amount. Right. But the next year, they get whacked anyway with the real levy. Because they, they didn't pay the tax that they were supposed to pay. Well... I I that would be the bank. And the they buy the house too. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. If they buy it the, at a certain time of the year, yeah. that whole that whole year could go well, not the whole year, but you know, the biggest part of the school tax would go right on top of it. Well, and I think banks, different banks have different policies. I think ESL, for example has one kind of a policy for how much they take of the escrow account and the other banks have yes. a different policy. It depends. Anything on else while I'm here? Or? No, thank you. Because I'm getting hungry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I haven't had any dinner either. Thank you. Okay. If you need anything else, thank you. I'm in my office filming. every day. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay. Any further discussion on assessment? Okay, we have Art Appleby from Code Review to talk about revisions to Chapter 36. <coughs> and I have to say, as I was plowing through this, and I only got as far as the enforcement section. Interesting, so. right? Yeah. Well, before we look at that, we need to go back to. 
Parkinson's real quick here. The two things that we probably should have, you folks probably should think of, is uh, something we just asked you about. Parking in Clinton Street. Oh, yeah, Clinton Street. This um, discussion happened before you folks got this draft. Um, it was proposed that we stop um, parking at Merchants Street, at, at no parking on, on Clinton West of Merchants. And um, some, of the re some of the businesses west of there said, no, 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 we can't do that. And um, the existing code says west of Utica Street, no parking. Um, so it's, it's obviously up to you folks, but uh, the, the revision, the, the, uh, the draft here says no parking west of Merchant Street. As I understand, Ferenti is the one that wanted that change. It was his suggestion. And then he the first rejected that. Back down he west. did reject yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. But the current write-up is? It says west of Merchant Street. West of Merchant Street. So can that be changed? So it should go back to west of Utica. Yeah. Okay. That would be my suggestion. The chief says he can solve the problem other ways. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so We'd that's be willing to thing. host a camera on our building, if that would help. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, is, um, it was brought up at the public hearing last meeting um, about commercial vehicles being parked in driveways, and uh, including dump trucks and people bring buses home that they had a, a, they work with, and I know there's many small business operators in the village that have construction equipment that they park in their backyards or in their driveways or wherever they have an opportunity to park them. And currently we have um, a short paragraph that says no commercial vehicles over one ton payload can park in residential. Um, I would suggest striking that. Just take it right out. Um, any a pickup truck, a small pickup truck, could be registered as a commercial vehicle, so that it could be fired. Well, as it is right now, if it's over a over a ton, which would take care of all pickup trucks. I mean, they're all a ton or less. Right. But a dump truck is three times right. or two, or you know, right. more than. More but that's that you want to strike that piece out. Yeah. Well, let me just find it here real quick. Why is that? Why, why do we have it yeah, in there? No. Why do you suggest striking it? Well, it becomes an enforcement issue and a, and a headache for any small business operator. What else? Are they, what are they going to do with their equipment? They can't keep it at their home. They have to go around someplace out, out of town for that. Um, do they have to register as a home occupation in order to do that? We haven't discussed that. Mm -hmm. um, it just raises an awful lot of questions. That's all. I think the, at least I would think the issue would be more not necessarily pick up truck that has a lot of equipment on it, parked in the evenings or weekends, but somebody who parks a uh, mobile home, you know, with a bagel type thing. Now, those are dealt with in a different place. Yes. Those are dealt with in the those trailer lot. Okay, okay. They're not trailers, though. No, no, they're not. Um, but they're dealt with in the trailer lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. I would certainly think that it would affect home values if your neighbor suddenly just starts to park dump trucks and in Well, maybe maybe the one ton is too low. In your next to your backyard. I mean, I wouldn't mind if you in a residential area. Or if you're thinking that people like uh, Bart Peters or. Uh, uh, Moser, Ted Moser. Yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. okay. So, but, but that's a, not the same as a dump truck. So, well, what Moser can, has? Can, can you define it in such a way that dump trucks, that lar those large vehicles, are excluded, but this, the uh, you know, commercial utility <coughs> vehicles are not excluded. You've got that's all different kinds of. You've got all different kinds of commercial. Vehicles. I mean, instead of one ton, five tons? Mm. Well, I, in the backyard, Teddy Moser's house, um, I guess it's his brother or something that they've got 
uh, backhoe and a bulldozer, and a very large trailer, oh. <laughs> and, um, and a small old truck. I'm thinking and, about the truck he drives around town. Yeah, now that's a different story, that's and, a and that's a, that's I'm a sure that's truck. heavier than a ton mm -hmm. too. That's a that's a that's a dual wheel van. You've got, got a little short time. school bus over on Kimberlin and Clark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But again, that's that's different in my mind than a bulldozer and a, a yeah. shovel and a dump truck and a. Yeah. I mean, it's just, those are yeah. strictly commercial vehicles that uh, seem to me to be out of place in a residential, and would seem to bring down the value and the character of a residential neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people don't have a dump truck no. they're parking in their backyard or uh, a shovel, or um, something like that. You might have a panel truck, I can, or a pickup truck that's heavy, but I, I just don't see, you know, a dump truck, you don't cruise around town with a dump truck, that is a, that's a construction vehicle. Right. Purely construction vehicle. To me, anyways. So do we just set a weight limit and call them commercial vehicles and stop at that? It becomes a problem. Do you set it as a, a gross vehicle weight, or do you set it as a payload weight, or do you talk about types of vehicles? Types of, is I, there I a type a, of vehicle? I, I would think gross the weight thing is going to be an issue for enforcement because yeah. uh, how are you going to find out what the thing weighs or what it right. can be? You have some some things that I think type of vehicles. Give you an I'll, I'll give you an example. Be very forthright. Example: the bus in my driveway. Well, right? we all know yeah, yeah, yeah. what that know. discussion was about. Yeah. I mean, it, it's gross vehicle weight's probably 10,000 pounds, but it doesn't carry, I mean, I don't know what its payload is. It's somewhere right around 2,000 pounds. It carries eight passengers in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, but yet it's big, you know. So, you know, do you, how do you, you know, it, it becomes real, a real problem mm -hmm. with, with how you So deal that's with probably it. that's within the one time. Well, I guess. I mean, I don't. You know, I don't know. It's. Maybe Mosher's truck. A truck is going to be more than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you? You know. So where do we set that? So how do you say? How do you take out construction, purely construction equipment, out of a residential area? Mm. But then. Good question. Well, we have we have rules and regulations about setting up businesses in residential areas. Or you have I mean the other issue that was that was the other one that was mentioned was the 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 seasonal um, construction vehicle that's a driveway ceiling truck that's around not all of the time but sometimes parked in the driveway of the you know of the um, the person who uses it. Yeah. So what yeah. is going um, this is already down to the attorney. This is a public this hearing. This is a public hearing. It's in the public yeah, hearing. So um, I'm just reacting to the comment and, that and, was made at the public hearing. And actually, I mean, if, if the, the limit was three quarters of a ton before, then right. then there were a lot of things that were apparently in, in violation. Yeah, which is why we increased that was the never, there had been There hadn't been, you know, it hadn't been an enforcement issue or whatever, but... Yeah. Maybe it needs to be readjusted. I mean, you know, you 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 could have a, um, I suppose, a restriction, and then, you know, God forbid, this would this would involve a lot of red tape. But you could have people apply to the zoning board for some kind of variance based on mm -hmm. what the vehicle per, was used for. Get a permit. Well, yeah. yeah. Have a system of issuing a parking permit for for a heavier vehicle. Yeah. Right. But how will that? How will a neighbor seek redress if yeah. you go down and get a permit to put a huge dump truck <clears throat> in the yard next door? Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it would have to be, it would be based on very individual things, you know, was the vehicle screened from, you know, from view, is it a bulldozer, is it, you know, something else, is it, you know, it's just, it's a real can of worms. And if you were going for a, a permit, wouldn't it be more or less like a variance too? Yeah. So mm -hmm. then in yeah. that situation, don't the surrounding residents get notified? Mm -hmm. that yeah, this, they would. In some so cases, it gives yes. them the opportunity mm -hmm. to speak to the issue. But then there's the issue.
that this is not in the zoning code, this is the parking code. Does the ZBA get to oh, right. address this as a variance? Or no? Um, my thought would be not because they're supposed to interpret the zoning code. Um, I throw it out, but I, <laughs> you folks are the ones that have to decide, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so I, you know, there it is. You might want to. Um. Well, you know, there are some people who vehemently object to having. Is the wrong thing? I'm sorry. <laughs> they they vehemently object to parking, um, you know, some sort of a recreational vehicle in the front yard, and there are but there are places where you just you can't do that. You know, you, you cannot take huge, um, you know, those two hundred thousand dollar motorhomes, and, and you can't plop them in your yard um, because it's, it's in some communities um, people are up in arms about it because it, you know, it, it, de we're it, de one of those. it degrades, it they have to be parked in the backyard or somewhere else. Yeah, it degrades the, the, um, the neighborhood and people rent spaces in yards for that reason. Um, but, you know, there is a, a clause there about you have to have, uh, you have to pave the area you park on. Um, we could have some yards that are all pavement, you know, and, mm -hmm. and we don't want that either. <coughs> uh, we don't want all the yards no, right. paved with for dump trucks and plows and, and shovels and whatever, I don't know. Um, you know, strictly construction vehicles. I mean, what if somebody has a construction business and they're parking all their vehicles in the backyard of their house in a residential neighborhood? Yeah, I'm not sure that that's that. happening, but you know, ostensibly it could happen yeah. that you have somebody who has a construction business and they're putting all their vehicles in their backyard in, you know, Brookdale Road. Um, so what would you want to do? I don't know what we do. The, the reason I bring it up is that this is the period to adjust this thing before you're done with public hearing and you have to say, okay, we approve or disapprove. I think it's still a can of worms. I think it, you know, I think maybe it ought to be, you know, it ought to be studied more. Maybe we should find out what other, I mean, I know what some other communities do or how they define it. I mean, it's obviously something that's been ignored for a long right. period of time. And, um, you know, maybe for now it should, should be struck out, but with the idea that, that we will take it up, study it, and, and come up with a, a proposal that takes all this stuff into consideration, because I'm not sure that we even have a handle on all the different kinds of things that are, that are parked in people's driveways, so yards, you know, whatever. That, that would mean that we will not pass this code change on December 2nd. Well, we, we could we, pass you folks could pass the parking law without this paragraph and then choose to add it at another time once the issue is resolved. Mm -hmm. I wonder what other communities do. I don't know. It probably, like you say, it's half of one and half of the other. <coughs> it depends right. on where they are. Right. It if we do, as you suggest, I'll take that out and pass it. Then we have no regulation to do anything. I can't see anybody in Brighton exactly. putting a dump exactly. truck in their backyard and getting exactly. away with it. Or a bus. Would it be fair to ask you, ask your uh, committee to conduct a you know a brief uh, 
set of inquiries, find out what some other communities in the sure. county do about that? Yeah. I would say do that and, and look around Bronport and see, you know, what all is parked in, in driveways and the complexity of things that you're going to have to, that we're going to have to deal with. And, and Don't the homes park their RV in there? No, they just bring it period. I mean, they no, they hardly ever, I don't even know if they ever park it there overnight. That's, that's, oh, I don't yeah, know they brought it in during the, but they park it somewhere during the winter and they... I think we've taken care of RVs and trailers because mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're in the trailer law. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. pretty clear that they don't, we don't want them out in the front yards in the wintertime. Yeah. Um, but not commercial vehicles, we haven't addressed those. Mm -hmm. So we'll do that. Um, that would be very helpful, helpful, I think. I, I think that it has a where, where we're going to have it classified by weight is going to be a problem for enforcement. Mm -hmm. I, I just think it makes it almost impossible. You're almost going to have to classify it. I do it by type of vehicle. Mm -hmm. So if you see a dump truck, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, if you see a well, bag hole, it's wrong. Well, your registration shows the weight of the vehicle. Yeah, but yeah, the, 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 the policeman is going by looking and seeing a, a truck there. He's not going to look up the registration and see what's registered at. Why not? Well, why, you want to tell anything mean, else. Well, he That's eyeballs true. it, and then if he thinks it's... Uh, that may be why we've got commercial vehicles parked yeah. in various places. Yeah. Because it's I, I think it's easier. Summer. That's a dump truck, and it's really much to worry about. Mm -hmm. right. you need to, yeah, that's a, so we'll leave this as is, is for now, and we'll study it. Is that what we're going to do? What we I think to have nothing there is mm -hmm. going to be worse than mm -hmm. right. something we're going to change. Right. Well, if you can't well, park an RV, leave it, saying leave it as it is. Right? You're saying leave it as it is. Right? If an RV has a law, then certainly a dump truck should have a law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we don't right now, so we don't. No. Want, so we'll look into that. But I think that, I think John's got a good point. Look at look at the different types of vehicles, and I mean, you may, you, may, <coughs> you don't want any of these. You know any of these things, but I think it. You know I think they are different. Right. different we just different look at all the different types of things. Have to put two columns: allowed, yeah. not allowed. Yeah. <laughs> I think from there you might be able to see that. Okay, here's how to put the thing together. But uh, for example, some guy with a pickup truck, uh, <coughs> he's got you know commercial or not plates on it. I don't see a problem with that parking in the, in the driveway. Mm -hmm. Personally, you may have a rack on the back end for a ladder or something like that. I mean, that's well, most pickup trucks are. They're going to be commercial. They, yeah, they're Plates. going to be commercial. No, when you go to register, they ask you which one you want. Oh, sure, right. oh absolutely. Mm -hmm. They do. The first and time you don't want to say commercial. But, like, I had a pickup truck, and they, they, I said, oh, put a commercial. They said, you sure? You won't be able, like, for example, you can't go on the Ontario State Parkway. That's right. The commercial sure. uh -huh. But so mm -hmm. usually your registration and your insurance are cheaper with a commercial. Could be. So that's the reason I got my But, I mean, you can't, but he wants to drive his right. pickup truck. I don't have any more. I don't have any more. He can get thrown off the parkway. Sure. Yes, you, so, yes, you can. But I, uh, but there's some point in time where you're going to say that this is a vehicle no longer allowed. Mm -hmm. you know, dump trucks, the obvious is like, dump trucks should not be allowed. In, in, in garbage, garbage trucks. Garbage no. trucks. Yeah, know. yeah. What if somebody parks a garbage truck? I, I, I want to understand the way it's going to go. If we adopt it, it's, it's going to have that sentence about a, a one, ton. one ton? Yeah, it's going to stay for now. Would, if it were two tons, would that cover these tradesmen's? One ton covers vehicles? most of them. But yeah. It's not going to cover, well, you know, it would even cover a small dump truck, but it wouldn't cover anything bigger than that, like the back hose. But it would cover like motors? Yeah, truck probably. And, okay, well, that's fine. Then. I hope he does cover it. But yeah, you know, I think I think with a statement too that this is something that 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 merits study and that we should we should okay. look at it. We'll do that then. Um, okay. And talking yeah. about merit, meriting some study. Yeah. The famous chapter thirty-six. The famous chapter thirty-six. <laughs> okay. So I sent you all a yeah. annotated copy of this thing, and today I spent the day going through comparing this with that to see what's changed and what's not. And I got all the way back to where it starts talking about residential rental, which is 36.4, and things start to get changed. Now, unfortunately, there's no page numbers on anything here, so you have to kind of go back and see. Okay. You're not quite halfway through probably a third of the way through. 
before you get to 36.4, you know, registration of residential rental properties. I had right there a question where it, it says um, residential rental properties is defined in 36.1D above. I could not find 36.1D in here. Did you not include all the pages or just pages that further? That may be a mess. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking because 36, the definitions are in 36.1D. Okay. B. So 361D, and I can find yeah, no 36. That's the old, that's the existing code. That's not okay, so it's not there. Okay. B. It's way back on D. And your definitions are, what, what was the what was the one? The definition of what? It, this is under 30, it's right where it says registration of residential rental properties 36-4, in that second. I must have flipped through there three times trying to find 36 1D. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, right there, that first paragraph has been changed and, um, but, and let's see what it does here. It re removed the 90, the 90 day. There was a 90 day waiting period, um, a grace period for first time um, because when oh, this yeah, law was constant. introduced, no one, no, no registration of rental properties existed. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they added this clause, giving everybody a 90-day grace period mm -hmm. and they signed up. That's been taken out because we're already underway and everybody's registered at this point. Mm -hmm. So that's been removed. Um, from there on down through, there's minor language changes. Um, in, this, in paragraph B under 36.4, um, it begins where the cross out within the 90 day period is indicated as crossed out for purposes of initial registration, including renewals annually. Now, I crossed that out myself because it's irrelevant. Um, owners of residential properties located in village shall complete and sign on a registration application provided by the code enforcement officer. It's, it doesn't matter if they're known as or, or renewals. Mm -hmm. um, uh, down under B3, the last line is added for at least three months of it on each calendar year. We're talking about um, property owners, um, um, managers for property owners that live outside mm -hmm. of 45 miles. Is this on the same dollars. page? Mm -hmm. Yeah, same page. B3? B3. Oh, local property, oh, okay, or so agents, yeah. So we included, um, if they don't live within 45 mm -hmm. miles for at least three months out of the year, they've got to have a manager. Okay. That's what that's saying. These other things stay the same. Um, any reference to 3611A2 should be 3610A2. Um, they're all, none of them have changed in here. 3611 what? 3611A2. Should all be 3610A2 because I, we, okay. our things got renumbered and things like that too. At the bottom of that second page, 365B, it's all been crossed out. Oh, yeah, I had. Can, yeah. We, go, can we go up to the first paragraph right yeah. there? Yeah, go ahead. You, all throughout this thing, you, you talk about the authorization to apply for a search warrant. Mm -hmm. Now, I assume the attorney went over this and okayed the term of the search warrant, yeah. but there's a difference between an administrative warrant and a search warrant. And you might want to ask him about this, because with a, with a search warrant, you're, you issue a search warrant when you're looking for, for probable criminal activity. An administrative warrant is one that deals with, with issues of, of safety and health and that sort of thing, which is, which is what you do when you're dealing with code enforcement. This should always say an administrative warrant. Instead of search warrant, yeah. Well, administrative search warrant, administrative warrant. I, think, I, think I mean, maybe the maybe the attorney. I mean, the attorney, I'm sure knows, but I mean, maybe maybe the term search warrant is also a generic term that encompasses both. I think but so. there is. But, but once you attack on the term administrative, that changes the meaning of it. At least that's what he seemed to be thinking. Oh. So he's saying you don't want to use the term administrative warrant. He's saying you do need to use the, the term administrative warrant or administrative search warrant. Okay, warrant. but that hadn't been, that's not changed here. It's search warrant throughout the whole thing. Uh, maybe I'm just, maybe just. Okay. Okay. 
What you're saying is the search warrant is done by a police officer yeah. and the administrative the words, warrant is done by the code civil. enforcement. Mm -hmm. but they need the word search out. It's a micro warrant, it doesn't matter. Well, you warrant. probably ought to call call it what it what it's you know, what it's proper. Yeah. I don't know. Ask a bit more of the paragraph here. I want thirty six twenty eight. Okay, I found it. The code enforcement right here where it says search warrant. Yeah. Yeah. Declare yeah. a search warrant. Code enforcement officer. So. That is that's a police thirty six four E. It's at the well, top this of the calls it a search warrant and this is written by a lawyer. And it would be issued by the town the town Supreme Court. Well, then you might want to put it past the police chief because I think there's a definite difference between an administrative warrant and a search warrant. Okay. There, yeah, there is. I mean, both are issued by well, both are issued by a judge, but but and one is. Did John Crusoe was that subject to the suit? That, that uh, he was using an administrative search warrant, and that there was a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, the, the and he was and he <coughs> lost the case. Well, um, yeah, I'm not sure how much it matters. And apparently, you think it does. But it's I would, yeah, I would definitely ask the attorney but again. The warrant, it. the warrant idea that was tested in the case of the Rochester mm -hmm. experience. Um, that they were sued by a group of landlords because. Just that thing. They, they, they were refused entry. They, they went and got the warrant. They, they went and looked at the property anyway. Who's they? They being the city. City of Rochester. Um, they, the landlords sued them. The landlords won <coughs> in court. The city appealed. The appellate court ruled for the city. And um, their warrant section looks exactly like ours. Um, so that is either vindication for us or a threat that it's, you know, <laughs> you know mm -hmm. if those guys, those landlords take it farther, which they probably won't at this point, um, then we could stand to lose that, but chances are we're not going to stand to lose mm -hmm. that. Uh, but I will find out, clarify okay. with your attorney yeah. what that should be called. Why, you mentioned, you sort of mentioned this thing, section 35, 36-5B, yeah. Why did the attorney delete that? He seemed to think that it was not relevant, not necessary. Not when a property sold, not to go through and, and re-inspect and, and issue a certificate of occupancy? No, that wasn't the reason. The reason was he thought it was probably covered in other places, and, and Scott thought that we should need this. Um, I, I tend to agree with Scott. Well, I certainly am looking at this. I can't imagine why you would want to delete it. I mean, if it's covered in other places. The argument we had in, in committee was, was <coughs> that a seller is not going to be real interested in making expensive repairs to a property in order to get a C of O. He's going to do whatever it takes to get it done cheap, get the C of O, and off you go. Whereas the buyer is going to be more willing to invest the money to do, to do it right, which means rewording this thing so that the C of O would be obtained after the title. Oh, okay. As long before. as it's done, yeah. As long as it's done. Um, okay. But then you've got to have some way to hold the new owner's feet to the fire. In other words, it, as it is now, you can hold the seller's feet to the mm -hmm. fire to get things fixed, you, or you can't sell it. But once it's changed hands, what do you have? Can I just insert one thing that if you're getting financing, the bank may require that you have a certificate of occupancy yeah, to be used as you ha are financing. If you're buying a three-family, then it has to appraise and you have but to get... But if you're not getting financing, then mm -hmm. that doesn't apply. Right, but still it's probably a good idea to get the C of O before it changes hands. Because otherwise, if it's required before it changes hands, as then... As it is, it does. Yeah. Yeah. As it is, it does. Maybe we just leave it. You mean not to put it back in? Put it back in. Yeah. But not reward it. You know what I mean? Yes. Okay. Um, the 
next two items are let's see. Uh, let's see, these are all renumbered. That's just renumbering, isn't it? The strike through yeah. mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let me see. A lot of the stuff on these two pages here has been not only renumbered but but rearranged. Um, the, the the things about um, let's see, F crossed out that changed to E on on the. Um, there were violations of the housing and building code or chapter 58 of the code or any other applicable elements. Um, these are, are backing up the placard part, which is there's a major major change later on in this in this draft. Um, and they're new, they're added here. Um, they're not moved. They're added here. They're taken from the next section, section 36. They're moved back here for some reason. And I think it was just because they kind of fit here better. Um, we talk about fees here more than we talked about them in, in the old code. Under 36.6 residential rental property renewal. Yeah, this is this is the one that I asked Oops. I asked the discussion to come before the board mm -hmm. because of the change that's in here. Um, it would take as it is now. It has been changed in this copy. Um, CFOs would be required, inspections and CFOs would change from three years to one year. Um, across the state, the time, there is no, there is no standard amount of time for CFOs. They vary from one to six years that I have found, and generally I'd say three years is about average. Um, but there are some college communities, like Fredonia has one year. Every year they do the inspections of the rentals. Um, so it varies widely. It varies by community to community. And we had noticed that in the three year scheme of things, many things we found were happening that that you couldn't catch, such as smoke alarms disappeared. Or... You know, the people who took the smoke alarms out threw them in the brush pile in the backyard and burned them around a bonfire. Um, you know, and if you do that at the beginning of the three year period, you could have a dangerous situation for three years. And that's a real story. So, Things like that really do happen that affect the safety of the individuals who are in these properties. Um, now, the question is, we're going to have a new code enforcement officer, and you know that person might have a different opinion as well. Um, there was, I think it was Cortland, wasn't it? It was Cortland. It was Cortland, had a very novel thing. And that was very appealing to the people on the committee. And that was a variation. And they had a three-year rental registration. Mm -hmm. And they had conditions um, such as the police being called for parties and nuisances, not emergencies, but parties and nuisances. They had um, complaints. complaints. Um, failures of the C of O, um, what other, they were, uh, there was a whole list of things. There was a list of several there, things, but the, the upshot was that if you had a certain number of these kinds of uh, violations that happened, you would get kicked down to a one-year inspection. Right. Mm -hmm. But you I would have to go before a court, yeah. and then the court would say no more, and they would severely reduce the time that you had for every property that you owned. 
Right. So if it happened in one property, it would affect all the properties. You would be named a persistent or mm -hmm. persistent not a persistent violator. Um, something like that. Something like that. Habitual violator or whatever it is. You were put in another category, and instead of three years, you'd have to go every two years or one years, and, and it would change. And the the landlords on the committee said we should give the people who have rental properties a reason to want them to pass and mm. to stay in good condition. <clears throat> I don't know if that's, but it, it, it could go for, you, you could have a habitual violator go for years and years and years before you catch them in that system. Um, and maybe what we need to do is to say, you know, we'll do everybody, if you pass an inspection, we'll have a yearly inspection, if you pass it two years in a row, we'll kick you up to three years and give somebody a reward for having a, pro a property that isn't really a problem property. So, I don't know, maybe we need some more time well, I think one thing that, that to look at this. It's going to matter a lot is, is the amount of time that's available to one person in that yeah. job. What, 370 properties in town? Like yeah, and, yeah. Um, one of the things we talked about, Scott and I talked about, was um, the idea of allowing the apartment complexes like President's Village and whatnot to self-regulate on certain things. And you go see them once every three years um, because they, those folks usually don't cause the problems. It's the smaller people that do. Um, Has anybody talked to Portland? A lot of units. Has anybody talked to Cortland to find out how well this works? And, we and, you know, I mean, that would be a good thing to do, probably. It's a, it's a law that's on the books, and I, I just found it. Yeah. I mean, I literally you just found it at the last the meeting. Yeah. No, no. But I gave you the, I gave you all the paperwork I had on yeah, it. Yeah, I think that I, somebody did. Yeah, it I is a, it's a law on the books. Calling them and talking to the code enforcement officer or, or um, you know. Whoever else, mayor, you and know, to see how, well it, how well it works, and, yeah. and any glitches in it, and if and if it's not working quite so well, what changes might right. they recommend? Right. To it? So, board, you want the one year? It, it would take three years to implement the one year program. Mm. There are people now with valid C of O's, mm. and if they had the valid C of O <coughs> six months ago, it's good for three years. <coughs> so the one year every your inspection, they yeah, they're, they're going to, this is going to phase in over three years. And I don't know how many people have just had a CFO issued to them, or... Files. I'm not sure if they have a listing of who's, I mean, I'm sure they do have a listing of who's got to be inspected each. Right, month. so I don't know how many of these people year, are good for three years before a, a change would even come to them. I think, I think that if you had a... a, a I flip it around a bit, Carol. It had a reward system instead of a punitive system. Yeah. So I have an annual CFO process, but if the CFO inspection proves to be no problems, it can be granted for two years. But that's if you what get two I, I of those think. in a row, it goes for three years. Yeah, yeah. that's what I and think. Give it a reward. Problem, you, if you're up for the law says every year, so you have to go up, you get a one year right. certificate after after your problems are fixed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But would it be a, would it would it work like Cornell's does, where if you would it just apply to a specific um, property then in that in that case? Let's say you own ten properties and um, you know, unlike the violation thing, only one owned. of your properties was really all, all owned individually by individual. Mm -hmm. uh, no. There are landlords that have multiple multiple but those properties. Are, but they have legal organizations, they have a corporation owning that property. Look at some of the titles associated. Yeah, LLC. Yeah. Well, some, some. Yeah. So that's an individual owner. He has one building. Yeah. That's what I wanted to ask. I, I didn't about go by building. building. Not, about LLCs. Not, try the, not try to chase the chain. Just mm -hmm. that building is a problem. It's a one-year yeah. certificate. Yeah. I like the positive approach. The, yeah, approach the reward thing. The, I'd rather have the positive yeah. approach and reward people who mm -hmm. do a good job in keeping up their properties. Mm -hmm. So I, think, I would say like one certificate, if it's good, it's good for two years. Two twos in a row, you get to go three years. If that's good, you go to stay at three years. And if you, if it's a bad one, you go back to one year again. Three years does three seem years. to be... Max. Yeah. 
I, I have yeah. a concern with um, us even considering all of these changes while we're in transition. Yeah, that's true. Of ha not having a code enforcement person. Mm -hmm. And I, I would suggest well, maybe we postpone any mm -hmm. of this until we get an well, active code enforcement. I just want to tell you that this is two years in revision. Mm -hmm. It was buried in the lawyer's slush pile for two years. And the other part of this chapter that we want to do is, and has been two years not done, is the um, administrative part to the rental registration fee. It's the enforcement the, part. The enforcement part, and I know I'm not saying it right. The enforcement part of the rental mm -hmm. registration fee is incorporated mm -hmm. in this and there are some people who are still refusing to pay the rental registration fee because we haven't passed Chapter 36, the enabling legislation. Mm -hmm. And we haven't passed the enabling legislation. And this has kind of been buried in a slush pile for two years. I, but do you but, want to go you, another year? No, 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 you wouldn't have to because go Because I'm just saying postpone yeah. it for maybe three yeah. months. Yeah, I agree. I tend to agree with you. We don't have an active code enforcement. I understand that, but we're going to hire somebody to enforce our code. Yeah. Not to write it for us. But rental registrations in January. Thank you. I, I don't think we should push forward. Thank, I agree. I think we hire some, yeah. And if, if we get somebody that can show us where we're wrong, we'll make an amendment to it. Yeah. No, that's true. That's the only question, and, and everybody on the committee, I think, was pretty set on giving the carrot and giving the rewards and mm -hmm. and doing something yeah. with um, the people who are quite conscientious if, and if you want to move ahead, even if that's three years where it is, it's going to be easier to implement that. Three. Three years is too long. There's too much you know, it has we're, nothing to do we're with we're missing all kinds of it's and it has not Carol, your example years. that you used was a smoke detector. What we're talking about is taking houses and building new bedrooms. That's a smoke detector is nothing. I mean, yes, so there's there's some safety, but then there's the whole and more bedrooms, bigger driveways, yards turn into parking lots, and you know, all this can happen quite readily in uh, at a three year time period. You know, if anything, you should err on the side of doing it too often, which would be once a year, and maybe that's not too often. Another question that came to my mind is how many rental units are in the village of Geneseo? If they can do it every year, how many units are there in Fredonia. Geneseo? Or Fredonia? Fredonia. Oh, Portland. If, it was Portland. Fredonia does yearly inspections of oh, all college rooms. So how many? There were, there were more, I just don't, I don't know the names. So if they can do it, how many people do they have employed as building inspectors? There you go. Follow their lead. Actually, I have, to, I have to make a point of order. You're technically in a workshop. You're, you're not, not allowed, allowed to, talk. to talk. Sorry, with, I won't say another with word. Permission. <laughs> we did give you permission before. I mean, you raised good points. It's not that. Yeah. It's just the, the thing is that these problems are happening, and they're happening on a continual basis, and we're not catching them. We are not identifying these problems. So how? I mean, it wouldn't take that much to, to put into, to make that change, the positive change that the Code Review Committee seems to be inclined to go for. I mean, that's a pretty simple fix, we right? Go there. Um, as I said, I didn't get the copy that she had of Cortland's Law, so I haven't mm -hmm. seen it. But, um, but at the same time, I also would, along with it, I would really talk to Cortland and, you know, find out, make sure it's not a terribly flawed law that, you know, they're having a lot of trouble with. Well, we don't want Cortland's Law. Well, it's oh, I'm sorry. Period. That's the other way. Yeah, right. It's the, the positive. Excuse me. Okay. Other than that, we were really ready to go on this. Where's Where's the enforcement part? I, I didn't the enabling that. legislation. I don't know. So an administration. <laughs> Where is that? Um. Yeah, um. 
part, the part of this that really gets changed is the, the part about unsafe structures. The, uh, the change from three years to one year really isn't, isn't a big deal. Um, we would have to add whatever language is necessary to make you know, the, the graduation stuff that, you know, the carrot approach. Uh, reality, and that would probably go um, back where we were here. Um, where were we? Thirty-six sixteen. I'm saying. Yeah, that's the part that got changed a lot. Um, that's concerned with um, placarding and. And uh, a lot of the lawyer added a lot of stuff in that neck of the woods, but for the registration, fines, civil penalties, and fines. No, it'd be, it would be thirty-six four when we were registration and residential mm -hmm. office. We would just simply rewrite that section. And the rest would probably not change that whole great deal until we get back to placarding and unsafe structures. Um, that part of it. Starting at 3615. Um, that's at the end of Article 1, and then Article 2 is unsafe buildings. And this is largely new. Um, well, I still have it by the lawyer. Up to Article 3, and then that's enforcement and um, There are changes written to the enforcement part, um, but structurally, that's essentially where it was. Not most of the state thing. So, the, but the rental registration the part. was written in there. Yes, it was. Yes. So, we go with what we have now, which is the enabling legislation and the one year mm -hmm. as it's written, and then. When the new code enforcement officer, whoever he is, no, 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 we can work on adding that right away. We can, yeah. Okay. The, the, the yeah. change that we talked about, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the, the big issue with that in terms of executing the whole thing is going to is the scheduling. Mm -hmm. The scheduling of you know of inspections for. 370 yeah. places, you well, know. We, are, we can't legislate the schedule. We no, no, I know. I'm just, I'm just saying yeah. it's just something to think about in terms of yeah. when you, you have somebody doing that and you go to annual inspections. It's not, you know, um, that's the real issue with the scheduling of the inspections. <coughs> well, what's the answer to the question on that F finds the comment on the, the right margin? Asks a question there. What's the answer? To that? Is the intent of the fund to be? Oh. Which one? Where are you? <coughs> yeah. Oh, the, the I see it. Yeah. <coughs> oh yes. Uh, the, the lawyer wrote this as three hundred and fifty dollars per week, <coughs> not per day. Our current folks said per day, mm. and each day is no offense. He said in most municipalities it's 350 or whatever it is per week, per week yeah. and each week is a new offense. Right. Giving people an opportunity to pay up um, before the next week comes along. Well. And you don't want, I mean, you have to write a new ticket and do all the paperwork every yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, which is the reason this fine section is rewritten largely. Mm -hmm. So there's really not much to be done to this. No. At all. No. We've belabored over it as for I, a long time. Yeah, as I indicated to you, that there's, <laughs> there's a lot of language stuff that needs to be fixed and references, as, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. that need to be made sure of. Um, now, have, we, have we had the public hearing on this? No. 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 Um, well, 
give us time to write this new stuff in and then we probably won't be talking about it until January. Thank you, Art. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. What a joke. Yeah. <laughs> and I We're speeding along. <laughs> I didn't do most of this. Who are the members of your committee? Um, <clears throat> Let's see. Mark in alphabetical order, Gordon Fox, Mark Christensen, no, that's not in alphabetical order, Dan Donovan, um, Bob Duff, John Bush, John Bush, and me. That's about it, right? And plus, whatever lawyer you can get to show up. <laughs> yeah, they change frequently. Yeah. Okay, I'll let you go. Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you much. That was informative. Um, I just had one other announcement. I, I had mentioned um, at the village board meeting something about doing a, uh, in support of Shop Local Saturday, the, the, the board or whoever wants to, to, to join me in, in doing it to, to give out mulled cider and, and coffee to downtown shoppers. And I called Daryl Stewart and mentioned it to him and he talked to the merchants and they're very happy that we want to do this. And Tamara Barris at BB Mills has actually offered us space inside the shop so we don't have to do this outside. To be <laughs> We're getting a blizzard. Well, not Saturday. That's tomorrow. And yeah, Saturday. thanks. <laughs> Saturday should be fine. Deal. But, but anyway, I'm, I'm going to get cider. I'm going to get usually rubs. If you buy a bunch of cider, they actually donate the donuts. And I'm going to get coffee. I'll get it from, you know, from, from Java and just serve hot coffee and mulled cider and anybody that wants to, you're free to come. It's just where, for two hours, 10 be? at BB Mills on Main Street, uh, 10 to 12 on Saturday. Next to the Methodist Church. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll it used, to, it used to be the frame shop. I'm just wondering if we're going to be seen though if it's inside a shop. Well, like I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to talk to, well, I don't know, we can. Yeah, help it. <laughs> you put on your parka too. And you okay, I'll, I, I plan to be there. Yeah, okay. I'll be in my need a parka. Yeah. yeah, well, we, you know, we could do it because we certainly, I, certainly I would be more noticeable. Be yeah. noticed or seen. Yeah. Yeah. Our, we'll be looking Bye. as an advertisement for that Bye, right, thanks. Yeah. We'll become an ad you for that You could get a tent with sides on it and eat it. <laughs> like they do it, like they do at the market. To build a structure. <laughs> By the time we deliver stuff, are they coming to us or are we delivering this? No, no, they would be coming to us. We would be in a, you know, visible somewhere offering stuff to people. So they know about it. By. Well, I don't know. They'll, they'll have to. Oh, they'll have we're to doing it to passersby. To passersby. Yeah. I thought we were doing this for the merchants. Oh, well, them too. You know, oh, okay. anybody. But it's for shoppers. You know. Okay. Whatever. Okay. So I'll talk to Tamara and I'll mention about, I'll say, John wants to be outside, you know, I'll be inside with <laughs> I was going to say, how, how hot is this stuff going to be if we're outside in this weather? Long extension cord. It's just long extension cord. Anyway, okay. I'll get the details and I'll, I'll email it around to, to everybody. Huh? What time? 10 to 12. So I get mm -hmm. there earlier with stuff. Like the time. Well, Saturday. And hopefully... Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully the, um, the lights will be up for Shop Local Center. I have to go. Can we adjourn so that I can go and work on the village reeds? Oh, yes. We yeah. have to go up. Linda, Linda they, were, they were starting to look all over from Linda said, do we have those reeds? I said, no, I said, I think you better call Carol. I've been asking for months for these reeds, and they go, oh, we wanted to put them up tomorrow. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. Hey, they're on to it. That's good. Yeah. Okay.